get it, Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine. As we speak, Russian forces are pushing towards Kiev, and more than 200 Ukrainians already dead. The world is in shock. The French president said it's a turning point in European history. The British prime minister said it's the biggest war in Europe since World War II. The US president said the world will hold Russia accountable. But what about the world stock market? Nothing. It did not come crashing down after initial slump. It went back up by the end of the week. If the world is never going to be the same again, somebody forgot to tell it to the stock market. Well, maybe the stock market knows something that Macron and Biden don't. Hi, I'm David Wu, a former Wall Street global macro strategist. In this new episode of The Money Game, part one, I'm going to try to help you make sense of the stock market seeming unconcerned about the Russian invasion of Ukraine so far. I'm going to show you that as horrible as this war may be, there's one possible outcome that may lead to a durable peace in Europe, assuming all the players act rationally. Yes, I'm going to show you that you can condemn Putin and still hold out hope that this story has a constructive ending. Before I start, let me remind you that the stock market does not care whether Putin is a good guy or a bad guy. It only cares about what is good or bad for the stock market. The stock market doesn't care about what happened yesterday either because that's already in the stock price. The market is only interested in Putin's next move. Is Putin's aim to annex Ukraine or not? Is he interested in world domination? If you really want to know, you need to try to think like him. With your permission, I'm going to take you on a journey inside his head. Just one rule though. Let's assume for the time being that Putin is trying to win. Let's assume that he's rational, motivated only by his self-interest in the interests of his country. A lot of analysts and pundits are saying that Putin is trying to rebuild the old Russian empire of the czars. It is said that he keeps at his side a bus of Peter the Great, the 18th century czar who brutally yanked Russia into the modern world. If this is true, then Putin's aim is to annex Ukraine. But let's have a look at the numbers. Ukraine has a population of 44 million. That's roughly that of Spain. It is the second largest country in Europe after Russia, similar to the size of territory of France. Ukraine has a history of violent protests, the Orange Revolution of 2004, the Maiden Revolution of 2014. Ukrainians are not the kind of people who will let you walk all over them, at least not for very long. And as it looks now, they're putting up a hell of a fight. If Putin wants to permanently occupy Ukraine, he will need to station a minimum of 1 million troops in the country, meaning that occupation is massively expensive in manpower and military hardware. On February 24th, Putin said that he does not plan to occupy the Ukrainian territory. Whether he's telling the truth or not, I think we should assume that even Putin realizes that a long-term occupation of Ukraine is not economically sustainable. So if Putin's aim is not annexation, then what is the real purpose of the invasion? Putin said that he's strongly opposed to the expansion of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization created in 1949 to counter the threat from the former Soviet Union. Putin is especially opposed to NATO membership for Ukraine, the largest European country sharing a border with Russia. Assuming that's why Putin invaded Ukraine. How can he achieve this goal without a permanent occupation of Ukraine? Once Putin has succeeded in obtaining the surrender of Kiev, assuming that he does, he can force the Ukrainian government to adopt neutrality in his constitution. Neutrality is exactly what Henry Kissinger proposed back in 2014. The former US Secretary of State suggested that Ukraine take a posture comparable with that of Finland that is associating with Europe politically and economically by avoiding institutional hostility towards Russia. Kissinger is not the only one. The French President Emmanuel Macron was recently asked by a reporter in Moscow whether Finlandization will work for Ukraine. His reply was, yes, it is one of the options on the table. He later denied it. What is Finlandization? During the Cold War, Finland, which shares a border with Russia, enforces strict neutrality remaining outside both NATO and the Warsaw Pact. Today, Finland and Sweden, which also has a border with Russia, are two European Union countries that are not in NATO. Has Ukraine ever considered neutrality for itself? As it happens, when Ukraine became an independent nation in 1990, its constitution actually included the principle of future neutrality. It was not until 2019 that a constitutional amendment was passed committing the country to becoming a member of NATO and the European Union. 
If Putin wants to ensure that Ukraine never becomes a part of NATO, he just needs to demand that the Ukrainian government reverse the amendment and make neutrality a permanent article in his constitution. He can also condition the withdrawal of his troops on the recognition of Ukraine's neutral status by the West and NATO. The West won't like it, but given that such an outcome could remove a major bone of contention between Russia and the West, I assume that the West will sign on to it in the end, albeit reluctantly. I think this is at the heart of Putin's plan. But what if the Ukrainians refuse? Assuming the Ukrainians are also rational players in this game, they should realize by now that the Americans and the Europeans will do nothing to defend them beyond grandstanding speeches about liberty and the inviolate sovereignty of nations. This means neutrality may be ultimately in Ukraine's own best interest, as it is for Finland and Sweden. Remember what I said before, I assume that Putin is a rational player, but you might think otherwise. For example, you might say that his fears of NATO expansion are completely unjustified and are a sign of a paranoid person at best and a rational person at worst. Why does Putin hate NATO so much? NATO has never invaded or threatened another country. However, did you know that the architect of America's Cold War containment policy happened to agree with Putin? George Kennan, a man who was known as the Dean of America's Russian experts called the expansion of NATO into Central Europe the most fateful mistake of American foreign policy in the entire post-Cold War period. Let that sink in for a moment. Cannon believed, as did many Russian experts, that expanding NATO would damage U.S. efforts to transform Russia from an enemy to a partner. Cannon was not a man who mints words. He called NATO expansion a tragic mistake that would make the founding fathers of America turn over in their graves. Developments over the past week have sadly vindicated George Kennan. I do not condone Putin's decision to invade Ukraine. But if this war ends with a neutral Ukraine, it could help build sustainable peace in the region. And one thing is certain, the stock market likes peace and stability more than uncertainty and war. I'm not saying that this is the only possible outcome from this war. What I am saying is that this is a likely outcome if all the players around the table act rationally. Of course, I don't deny that these days rationality seems to be in short supply, but there's nothing wrong with basically hoping at least. I suspect the stock market is doing the same. If you like this program, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit like. If you want to watch the second part of this program in which I will discuss my investment strategy for this and other major macro themes via stocks, bonds, and currencies, please come visit us at davidwuunbound.com.